Hi folks, it's Jennifer from Hunter's Home. All right, so when last we spoke, we talked about Minerva and her um, her life here and kind of what a day in the life of Minerva looked like, uh, you know, the kind of things that she had to deal with on a, on a regular basis and the things that were under her um, responsibilities. And then so today we're going to talk about Eliza Jane and her life during the Civil War here at Hunter's Home. So what happens is Minerva passed away and George married her youngest sister, Amanda. And at that point in time, they that's really kind of where the story eases off a little bit here at Hunter's Home because they don't really spend as much time here as they were spending whenever Minerva was still alive. So what happens is they're going to spend half their year here and then, and that's going to be in the summer. And then in the winter, they go to Louisiana where George has that sugar plantation at Tally Ho. And so since winter is caning season, you know, they go down there and that's where they're going to hang out. So half the year they're gone and the house is under the care of the enslaved people that they leave here because of course they're going to take some with them whenever they go down because they have to help them you know, along the journey and getting dressed and, and, and cooking for them and taking care of them and all that sort of stuff. So, um, it's kind of in the care of the overseer who was Mr. Latta and the enslaved people who are living here. All right. So then the civil war comes. Now when the war comes, um, you know, everything just kind of goes to hell in a handbasket, uh, especially here because you, you even get that, that, issue that happens with the with the Cherokee Nation once they came out here, they, there was a lot of infighting with each other, kind of like a civil war on its own. And so all those old animosities are still there. And so whenever the civil war comes to Indian territory, you know, people are kind of using the the new civil war as an excuse to take revenge on each other for things that happened in the past. And um, it just caused a lot of trouble at this point in time. Um, so what happens is the Federal troops are pulled out of Indian territory. The Confederacy comes in. They start talking to the nations here. And they start telling the nations, you know, they're going to take all your enslaved people. They, um, I know they told you that you can live out here for the rest of your life, but they're really, you know, looking at taking your land away from you. Um, if you side with us, then we're going to, you know, not have you... Um, leave this land, we're gonna leave you alone, and we'll also give you delegation in our Congress, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna take a lot better care of you than, than the federal government ever was going to. Um, <clears throat> oh, by the way, they're also, when this is done, gonna take your land away from you and let, you know, settlers move back in, that kind of thing. And so that's what they're telling the nations here. And of course, you know, some of the nations are gonna side with the Confederacy because that's something they believe in. Um, other people want to remain neutral, like, like um, John Ross and others, you know, want to, go for the north, you know, that kind of thing. So so here, there is also the same fighting that there is in the United States at the time, because we have to remember, this isn't a part of the United States. Um, it's a completely different country. Um, and so what happens is they come here, they talk to John Ross. John says, you know, Chief Ross says, this isn't a part of our fight. We don't. It doesn't have anything to do with us because we are not the same country. You go back to your country and handle that stuff. We're going to stay here. This is ours. And it's not a fight with us to have to deal with. Well, then here comes Stan Waiting. Um, who says, I'll raise a militia to fight for you. And Chief Ross is like, ah. <laughs> so if the Confederacy wins, then that means that, um, that you know, I'm not going to be chief anymore because Stan Wadey supported them where I didn't. And, you know, he probably had other reasons. But in the end, he, go, he goes ahead and sides with the Confederacy as well. He allies with them. We had some reports that say that the they kind of camped across the street. And he came out here, uh, across the street here at Hunter's Home. And Chief Ross came here and signed the papers there. And um, it was a done deal. Well, then the federal troops move back in, beat the Confederacy out, and arrest Chief Ross for siding with the Confederacy. So, I mean, it's just this huge mess that happens. But in the end, what ends up happening is that the, the, the federals take Chief Ross and his family, and then they take Amanda, who's living here with, with her 10-month-old child, um, George having left here, taken some enslaved people with him and gone um, east, so she, she's by herself here um, at the house with just, you know, the, the enslaved people that he left behind. And so they take her and the rest of the enslaved people here, and they all go up to Fort Scott, Kansas. All right, so <clears throat> this is where E. Jane comes in, and that's Eliza Jane. We've just kind of gotten in the habit of calling her E. Jane. Um, so she is the daughter of Elizabeth Ross, who is Lewis and John Ross's sister. And so she was living over by the Illinois River, and her home was burned down. And so... 
before she left, Amanda said, hey, you don't have a house. Um, and you're probably, you know, not well enough to travel. Do you want to come here and watch our house for us uh, while we're gone? And so Elizabeth is like, yeah, and I'll bring my daughter, you know, E. Jane with me. And so Elizabeth and Eliza Jane come here and keep an eye on the house and the furniture and everything else that's left behind while they're gone. So, so that's what, where we're at here. So a little bit of background on E. Jane. She was a, a teacher. You know, she attended school so that she can become a teacher. And she taught at... Um, until the schools were closed down for the war. And then, of course, she comes here. <clears throat> so by that point, she's raised a little bit of money, that sort of thing. All right, so Amanda's gone. George is back east. And now Eliza and Elizabeth are staying here at the house, keeping an eye on it. All right, so we're going to read a couple of letters so that you kind of have an understanding because we're not talking about E. Jane so much as we're talking about the women who kind of held down the fort during the time, and so I want to set the scene a little bit. All right, so <clears throat> this is a letter to, um, to one of the children of Mary Jane. All right, so Mary Jane is Amanda's sister. Um, and so she is married to William Potter Ross. And what happens is she's in Kansas in February of 1863 and she writes her son um let's see here she writes her son you are constantly in my mind i write often so you will be obliged to answer my letters your papa is at mayville or was a few days ago but expected to go down to park hill with some wagons and 100 men taking flour to the poor people there stan Wadey's men have acted very badly indeed since we left they took all of Uncle Robert's things and gave them away, Aunt Min's too, and robbed Mrs. Gunter's house while she was dying. Your devoted mother, Mrs. William Potter Ross. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so Aunt Min is, I believe, Araminta. So, so they called Minerva Nerve. They called Araminta Min, and they called Amanda Mangi. So that's kind of where you're going to... So just kind of try to keep that in mind while we're going through this. All right, so that's the situation that's going on at the time. All right, so this is a letter um, to Sarah Stapler from E. Jane, um, and it's dated March 22nd, uh, 1863. And so by this point, they are living here in the house at the time. She says, Dear Sarah, for the last seven months, the storm of war has howled so fearfully about us that we have found it hard to compose ourselves sufficiently to write even to our best loved absent friends. But John and Lewis are just in from headquarters, and as we are expecting a large scout down, I'll try to have ready a few words for you. It was vain for me to endeavor to picture to you the terrors and trials we have passed through since we last parted. Several times I have kept a daily account of what was passing, and then a new alarm would cause me to burn what I might what might fall into the hands of our enemy. More than once, when our poor boys would venture home, they, at a moment's warning, would have to rush to the thickets, and my feeble hands would then unaided secret saddles, saddlebags, etc. One day, just as Daniel, Lewis, Jim, and others were making their way up from Gibson, a party of Wadey's men followed on a couple horses behind, found a Drew man sitting by the road. I'm going to give you guys a trigger warning here because it does, I mean, we're talking about war, so they're going to be saying some really gross stuff, so just keep that in mind. <clears throat> so um, Stan Wadey and uh, his man followed on a couple of horses behind, found a Drew man, sitting by the road, killed him, and then placing a rope around his neck, hauled him about as children would a sleigh. They occupied themselves long enough at this to give our folks time to get here. Josh came in at the same moment and told me that 200 secesh would be up that night. I flew up to James for Jim and Robert and sent from there up to Uncle's, Rose Cottage, Daniel and Josh to go along, but he, Daniel asked Josh to go along, but he declined. Um, but there is scarcely a day that we do not have some new fear to encounter. Just now, we are very much in danger. The secesh have crossed at Weber's Falls and are robbing at a terrible rate. Oh, why don't our friends hasten along? The people are starving and the smallpox has broken out. Are we doomed to destruction? The people will come here to beg, and I fear the next thing we will be down to. And so she's talking about how since there's nothing here because the the raiding parties have been running around all over the place um <clears throat> and there's 
there's nothing here because by this point in time, the men are gone. Um, the enslaved people are gone from this place in any case. And so it's up to the women here to take care of the situation, to take care of things that are going on. So they're having to be the ones that are planting. If they want food, they got to plant it. Um, they're the ones that are running the grist mill and things like that. Um, and so they're having to do things that they never before had to do, um, taken care of. All right, so, and then the, when she says the people will come here to beg, and I fear the next thing we will be down to, she's talking about the smallpox. So it's going on like crazy around here, and um, people carry it with them whenever they go to ask for food. And so sometimes they'll go to a house and they'll beg for food, and they'll be given a little bit of something, and that exchange will have passed the smallpox, and then the people who gave the, the food to the the people who were, you know, destitute would end up coming down with smallpox and dying. And it's kind of spreading like wildfire um, in that way. Um, she says, but we have been in good health so far. Katie and I cook, wash, make fires, work in the garden, and even work an old mule on the cart when we get out of wood. Last week, we put the children and a few shrubs in the cart and went up to our graveyard. I planted a few bulbs and a rose bush around your, your dead as well as ours. A part of the wall <clears throat> around Uncle L's square has been broken down and the stones over Lewis's children much injured. And she's talking about going up, and I'm pointing to the east over here because that's where Ross Cemetery is in um, relation to me right now. Um, he's talking about the stones falling down around Minerva and um, John's graves. All right, so it was a sad visit. The first time we have ventured so far since Johnny was buried. We planted some rose bushes around Aunt M's grave and a bulb or two on top. God only knows how, so how soon some more of us may be sleeping there if we die and there is anyone to bury us. <clears throat> then she goes on to talk about somebody else is taken prisoner, um, possibly killed. Um, other people are killed, you know, probably by their own party for robbing. Um, then she talks about how, you know, everything's in bloom now and she dreads to have the leaves out because bushwhacking will then commence in earnest if their friends don't come soon. It'll be too late to make corn. And so what she's talking about there is she's asking, or she's, she's talking about how she really wishes the federal troops would come out here, um, to kind of keep that bushwhacking at a, at a limit and, um, enable her to be able to get some corn planted so that they can have food. And then she says other people have been taken. Um, she says that, um, so other black people are taken by the Confederates. Um, people have hired others to work for them. Um, there's a Cherokee girl who was working here for, for E. Jane, um, but she ended up getting um, the smallpox and passed away, you know, that sort of thing. And so she's talking now about the situation, how it is and how they're, you know, not having any, any people, there's there's nobody to help them in that sort of situation. All right, and then we have a letter from William Potter Ross, who is Mary Jane's husband, to his son. And it kind of tells him that uh, there was a report that, <clears throat> uh, let's see here, there was a, a report that some of the Confederates were coming in. There were an army of 20,000 men, and um, they only had a few hundred that would be able to hold out against them. So those kind of things, those kind of reports she's going to be getting um, while she's living here because, you know, of course, people are talking to one another. They're getting letters to each other, <clears throat> you know, very sporadically, but they're able to kind of communicate with each other. And, and if you're living in the middle of a war um, where your property is basically the battlefield, you're going to be very aware of what's going on and very... Um, quick learners whenever it comes to movements on uh, uh, troop movements and things like that. And so E. Jane, in some of her letters, she's talking, she's talking some, you know, like she almost is right there with the, with the people as they're, you know, giving their orders and things. All right. So this one is a little bit torn up. <clears throat> so it's um, not exactly great, but what she's talking about is that, um, so right here, she's talking about, Colonel Phillips has been removed because his presence has interfered with cattle stealing. Um, she's talking about how a company of black soldiers were um, attacked and cut to pieces by the rebel army and they cut the throats of all the men and took all their clothing and then guarded them until they sent uh, for Colonel Waddles to come and bury his dead. Um, now she is saying that the large grain is now all gone. She's surrounded by poor, miserable wretches, widows, and little children. What can I do, she says. I cannot let them 
freeze and starve before my eyes. My dear friend, it is more than I can do to sit down and eat a meal while a dozen or more half-famished little children are standing at the windows peeping in. We must give, and then our flour gives out. We don't waste a crumb of bread. With part of Miss Raymond's money, I bought a sack of flour so I could bake bread and give it to them. You see, I have some of the generosity about me yet. I am prouder of a sack of flour than I used to be of a hundred dollars. And so she's kind of talking a little bit about how life is really bad at the time to where a point where she, you know, used to be really proud of having a lot of money. Now she's just like, I've got flour. I'm doing good. Um, all right. And here's a letter from her to Chief Ross. And she's talking about how, and this is December 31st of 1864. Of course, she's still here in the house. And um, she says, dear uncle, the last hours of 64 are drawing to a close. Another year laden with its burden of human guilt, of anguish, and unutterable woes is registered in eternity. At this time, my mind reverts to glad festivals once annually held within the halls of Rose Cottage. We too are thinking of the loved ones who were once assembled at dear uncle's family gatherings. We are scattered now. The storm has driven us far apart, never all to meet again. Death has made vacant to more than one seat in our midst, and tonight we mourn with you the loss of dear cousin James, that he should survive his long confinement and yet not live to be soothed by a loved father, by his little children, sisters, and relatives in his last hours is indeed very trying. Our hearts all cry out. Oh, that we could but have seen him for a little while. We dearly loved cousin James and know but too well how dear uncle's heart must be wrung with grief. Um, the information of brother's release and cousin's death affected mother very much. I think for the first time she regretted not having tried to go east. She now tell, says, tell your uncle how much I wish to see him and all once more, but I am not able to go so far. I hope to stay here while I live and at last be buried on the hill. Aunt Susan sometimes comes over and stays several days with us, and I do what I can to make them cheerful. Aunt Susan and her daughter Susan live alone, as we do. I gave Aunt pretty liberally of the flannel and domestic that you sent, for I know if you could, seen her, could have seen her need, you would have said give it to her in preference to the younger ones. She still has the shawl you sent her, and Uncle Lewis gave her a new blanket and dress, so she says she is fixed until the secesh comes again. We are now living in comparative security, so far as we know, but provisions are very scarce. The only bread we all eat now is pounded corn, or wheat flour is said to be selling at $30 per hundred pound. I write these things because I know that while God gives you life, you will never lose your interest in your kinsmen and people. And so she's kind of describing the situation that is here. Um, basically, they're destitute. Uh, there's nothing here anymore. You know, it's, it's women who are kind of keeping hold of things at this point in time and, um, and men who couldn't go off to fight. <clears throat> and so, you know, that's why, where you see a lot of the def defections from the army happening. So some of these people, you'll see they go AWOL and they call them cowards and all that stuff. But in reality, there were a few of them that were leaving the military because they hear that their wives and their sisters and their mothers and their aunts are going through the same thing that, you know, E. Jane and her mom are going through here. And so they're leaving to go back home to try to help their family. Um, because at this point in time, they don't have grocery stores to go to. They don't have places that they, they can go to. They are relying on the help of family members who can help them um, or who can send them things. And so they have family that are behind enemy lines back east, um, like John Ross, um, sending them supplies and things here because they can't get it here. And then whenever they do get it, um, you know what she's saying is she's fixed until the secesh comes back. Whenever they do get it, they're raided by the army. And so this place was raided several times by both sides. Um, we think that the reason why, there's a couple of reasons why the place is still standing, um, possibly because, you know, it's it's kind of a supply dump. You know, if, if the army comes out here and raids, they take all they can, but they leave the people here to rebuild, then they always have another place to come back to. And then, of course, you know, some people think that it, it could be also because when the Confederates come out here to raid, it's the home of a Confederate person. And so they're like, oh, okay, we'll leave it. Or if the, um, the North comes to raid, you know, Northern supporters are living here. So like, okay, well, we can't leave you without a house, that sort of thing. Whatever the reason, it remains standing. Um, even though, you know, Stan Wadey really tried his hardest to kind of get rid of the place. And so right here, 
we have a um, we have an interview done with regards to what happened um, here you know, during the Civil War. And so this is an interview with Miss Eliza Ross of Muskogee. And she says, <clears throat> I've heard my Aunt Jane tell of the terrifying experiences they went through. The Confederate soldiers raided the place several times, taking everything they had. They lived in constant fear of their lives. My grandmother was an invalid and she couldn't walk or go upstairs. So they locked themselves in the big dining room on nights and when they saw the soldiers coming. So that's the dining room downstairs. Um, and actually, you know, let's go ahead and go for a walk. You guys want to do that? All right. All right. So now we're in the dining room and I'm going to go ahead and finish reading this, um, interview. All right. So she says that her grandmother was an invalid. She couldn't walk, go upstairs. So they locked themselves in the dining room. That's this room that we're in now on nights. And then whenever they saw the soldiers coming. So one time Stan Wadey broke in and brought some of his soldiers into the hallway downstairs. Aunt Jane and Grandmother were in the dining room. The doors were locked, but Wadey took an axe and broke the door down, leading from the hall into the dining room. And so that's right here. And you guys can see this right here. That's where he broke the door out. And so we just kind of um, have it flipped here. And so it's, it's here, the dining room hallway door. All right, so... Um, he brought his soldiers into the room, and they proceeded to search the place while my grandmother and aunt, two helpless women, looked on. And so um, E. Jane and her mom, Eliza, are going to be sitting over here by this fireplace at this point in time. All right, so um, she says, they ripped open the feather beds and destroyed what they didn't take. My grandmother was sitting by the fireplace. She always wore a big shawl over her shoulders, and the house was cold. Wadey walked up to her and snatched the shawl from her shoulders, leaving her shivering in the cold. Aunt Jane, that's E. Jane, had taught school for a good many years. Teachers only got a small salary then, but she had saved what little she earned, denying herself all but the necessities, and had saved 700 in gold coins. She sewed them to the underside of a big leather belt and wore this all the time to keep it from being stolen. But that morning, for some reason, she hadn't put it on but laid it under the mattress on the bed. A soldier found it and took it and that left them with nothing to buy food. While the soldiers are searching through the house, Wadey stood, op stood in the open stairway in the dining room, so he's gonna be standing right over here, um, and kept sharpening a long knife. Every once in a while, he'd try it on his finger or on a piece of wood to test its sharpness. Grandmother and Aunt Jane sat there terrified, wondering what he would do next. Every time he tested the blade, he'd look at them as though he intended coming over and using it on them. Before the soldiers left, they'd taken everything they had to eat, destroyed and left them with nothing to live on. And then another time she says, um, weighty soldiers came and set the house on fire, then left. Driven to desperation, Aunt Jane managed some way to put the fire out. So he's going to be coming here and causing quite a bit of harm and set fire to the curtains at one point in time and then left. And, and um, of course, you know, E. Jane has to put that out and, you know, they're probably wondering what's next. And so that's what's going on here. All right. So that was a little bit of information about what was going on there. Now, Hannah Hicks also li lived here for a while and she, not here in the house, but she lived nearby. And she kind of kept a little bit of a diary while she mentioned some of the things that are going on. She mentions they have to come down and they don't have any animals to run the grist mill. And so they have to do that. Um, she talks about how they go into town to get supplies and they're raided by different people then as well. And so they're having some issues. And so at this point in time, women are doing the work that the men once did. Um, and in some cases, uh, the enslaved people once did. Um, so like the farming and things like that, you know, going after firewood, hauling water and things like that, doing all the laundry, plus taking care of situations under some immense distress because it was really um, quite a terrifying time. And some people at the point, at this time, were also at a disadvantage because like we talked about in the video with Minerva, some of these things they weren't allowed to do. So not only did they not have any experience with doing these things, they were also not allowed to do those things because it would reflect badly upon them, um, upon their husbands or dads or whatever if they, if they saw that they were doing those kind of things. So that's the kind of situation that's going on here. Um, e. Jane also talks about um, a time where the bushwhackers came out and across the street of where the orchards used to be, 
um, in a barn over here um, in front of the house, she says that they were just shooting back and forth and she happened to notice that there was a little boy there um, just kind of standing out there in the middle of the field with a dog and she couldn't get to him because there was a battle going on out there. And so finally when it ended, she was able to go get that child and bring him um, inside and take care of him. And then another time, you know, one of her cousins is bringing firewood back and, you know, he's seen and, and by the Confederates and he's shot and murdered and drug off from there. And so their daily seeing people be attacked, um, you know, be um, murdered, tortured, that sort of thing. This is, a, this is a regular occurrence that's going on at this point in time. And so it was, it was quite terrifying um, for people who were living here, but they managed to survive it. Uh, and so, and of course the house survived as well, which is just amazing. Um, after the war, you know, they stay here for just a little bit and then their family, her brothers, their family kind of moved into their own home. And so she kind of stayed with them a little bit. Um, but then she went back to teaching and she taught right up until her death in 1894. So by this point in time, she was 68 years old. So she survived a good long while. Um, and you know, she had quite a story to tell. She lived quite an adventure. I'm sure she could talk to her, her kids about that in the schools and things um, as a teacher. So that's our information on um, Eliza Jane Ross. And our next one that we're going to discuss will be the home after the Civil War. So we're going to start talking about Mary Jane at this point. Um, thank you guys for listening. Bye.